And so some of us will have been together earlier this morning. Some of us will have been involved in different services. Some of us today have been traveling or visiting or working in the garden or resting. And here we are, just before a new Monday starts again, gathered together in worship. So welcome. Just as we begin, or before we begin, I just want to go through a few things that, that are happening at the moment. I mentioned this this morning, but our session has decided that we would like to restart our Sunday school. And so what we're really looking for is two things, either people who are willing to join a group in, as we restart Sunday school, which will take place obviously, or planned to be in the mornings, and also any of you with ideas or thoughts for how we might go about re-beginning our Sunday school again. If you have any thoughts or ideas, please do just come and speak to me or send an email or a phone call or anything that suits. Join together in worship and sing that great hymn, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for a time of joyful singing. Thank you for the gifts and talents around us. Thank you for us being free to sing. Thank you for those who created the tunes and the words that allow us to express ourselves and our joy in finding you. Thank you for bringing us to this special place this night and to gather us in worship. Lord God Almighty, we praise you this night. We honor you this night. We come before you humbly, bringing all that we have. And we know that what we bring is not all perfect. We know that we have hurt. We know that we have made others feel bad. We know that we have thought things that we know are not right. And so we come before you not because we're perfect, but because you are perfect. And because you went to the cross so that we may know your forgiveness. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us and grant us your peace. And it is in joy in joy as we come to worship you in joy as we trust your forgiveness, that we now pray together the words taught to us by Jesus Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. The first reading tonight is from Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and on the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. And the second reading is from John Chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. Afterwards, 
Jesus, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the full net of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about 100 metres. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There was fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the nets ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. And they did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. When he said to him, follow me. Amen. God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Lord, you have come to the seashore, neither searching for the rich nor the wise, desiring Smiling, you have spoken. 
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're looking this evening at the final chapter of John's gospel. And in almost the final words of that final chapter of the gospel, And if you look slightly beyond the reading we had tonight, you'll see that Jesus seems to be indicating that John, unlike others, is going to live to be an old man. This seems to be John's role. Living to be an old man and to be a witness to history. And this story that he is witness to is beautiful. It's the story of the third time that Jesus has, had, Jesus has appeared to his disciples since he rose again. The first time on Easter evening when they were behind locked doors and he appeared and the disciples were overjoyed. The second time a week later when they were also behind locked doors and Jesus appeared. And as you'll remember, Thomas was there that time and he believed. But this third time, we're no longer behind locked doors. We're no longer in the city, but we're out in nature and we're by the seashore. Afterwards, Jesus again appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, and it happened this way. That's how John, the witness to history, starts his story, and it happened this way. There were six disciples there, two disciples whose names we don't get. Thomas, he was there again. And Nathaniel from Cana. And you'll remember Cana. That's where the wedding was. You remember the host ran out of wine. 
faced with letting down his daughter in front of all the people from the neighborhood. And Jesus didn't just turn water into wine, but into great wine. And instead of letting down his daughter, the host gave his daughter a brilliant day thanks to Jesus. That was Cana. And just before that wedding party, Nathaniel had looked down on Jesus and had said, nothing good can come from Nazareth. But here he is now years later on the seashore. And there's the sons of Zebedee, it says. In other words, John, our witness, who seems to be recording this, and his brother James. James, who is said to be buried in Spain, in a place now known as Santiago de Compostela, where some people here may well have been before. James and John are there. And there was Simon Peter, or just Peter. He's there as well. And Peter says to the rest, I'm going to go out fishing. Now you may be like me, and when you hear words like Peter going out to fish, you may think, well, there's nothing special about that. What's the big deal? I mean, Peter's a fisherman. But as David Lowe's explains, it is a big deal. It's a huge deal. Let me ask you a question about Peter going fishing. According to the Bible, before this time, when was the last time Peter went fishing? How many years ago? Well, in Luke 5, we can read of Jesus choosing his first disciples. How he was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee like now, and how Peter was fishing as now. And how Peter had told Jesus to go away from him because Peter did not think he was good enough to have anything to do with Jesus. But Jesus said, come with me. You may not feel worth much now, but you're going to fish for people instead. And Peter left his nets three years ago. And as we know, so much has happened for Peter in those past three years Jesus has told him that he was going to be the rock that he would build his church upon. Peter built up so much confidence that he promised Jesus that even when others may fall away, he, Peter, never would. But as we know now in the night when Jesus was arrested, after the soldiers had seized Jesus and led him away, Peter followed at a distance, and a young lady said to the others, this man was also with Jesus. Peter said, I don't know him. Then later, someone else saw him and said, you're one of those people. Peter said, I am not. Then an hour later that night, another person said that Peter was one of Jesus' people. Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. Then the rooster crowed. They arrested Jesus, turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. In Mark's gospel, in the version of Easter Day in Mark's gospel, when the women find the tomb empty, they are told to go and tell the disciples and Peter. It's as if Jesus is saying, I need to mention Peter specifically because he's suffering more than the others and I don't want to lose him. But Peter is almost lost because when Peter is now saying that he's going back fishing, he is in a sense saying goodbye. He's let down Jesus so badly. He realizes he was right all along. He's not good enough. And so now he's going back to his old life. And the others say, we'll go with you. And this seems to be the beginning of the end. But they fished all night and they didn't catch anything. A long night that matches the sense of desolation in Peter's heart. One of those times when you keep trying but get back nothing. But early in the morning, There are not cockerels crowing this time, 
but Jesus is standing on the shore, about a hundred yards out. The disciples don't realize it's him. He shouts out, friends, have you not caught anything? No. Put your net down on the right-hand side of the boat. You'll catch something there. Sure enough, they put the net down and it's filled with such a catch of large fish that they struggle to bring it to the shore. Jesus is there as a guide, seeing what others cannot see, knowing where the disciples are, knowing where we are. And our witness John now says that it's then that Peter, desolate Peter, heart now perhaps thumping, hope now perhaps rising, gets straight out the boat and splashes through the surf to Jesus. And the other disciples bring the boat back in, towing the net full of fish. The disciples and the boat and Peter. Remember, as Jesus said, it's the disciples and Peter. He's almost lost. He's the one who's hurting the most. And when they get to the shore, things just get better and better. Jesus is there and he's made a fire. He's cooking bread and fish. Jesus is there showing that God loved us first. And Jesus says to Peter, go and get some of your fish. Bring it to the fire. Peter goes back on board and realizes that things are still getting better. Do you remember when Jesus first met Peter? Do you remember that Peter, they were fixing the nets on the shore, on the boat? And now Peter goes back and he realizes that the nets aren't even torn. All that fish, and they won't even need to spend all that exhausting time repairing the nets. Come and have breakfast, says Jesus passes them the bread and the fish, showing grace, showing kindness, showing that God loved us first. And you think that Peter must be feeling wonderful. Well, on the surface at least. And after breakfast, Jesus seeks out Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Does Jesus mean more than these people? Well, I would like to believe the commentators who suggest that Jesus means more than these fishing things. In other words, don't say goodbye. Don't go back to your old life. Yes, Lord, I love you. Then feed my lambs, says Jesus. Look after the young ones, the new ones. Again, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Jesus, you know that I love you. Well, feed my sheep. Look after those who are already in faith. And again, Peter, do you love me? And as Ishbel read, Peter is hurt that Jesus would ask a third time, Jesus, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Knowing how awful and worthless Peter felt, after letting down Jesus three times. Here was Jesus asking the question three times, giving Peter a chance to wipe out that memory. How things have changed since just the night before Peter was about to give up and go back to being a fisherman. But then Jesus says to Peter, Peter, I'm telling you the truth. When you were young, you dressed yourself. You went where you wanted but there's going to come a time when someone else is going to dress you and you will stretch out your hands and you'll be carried to a place you don't want to go. By this, Jesus is indicating, as it says, what kind of death Peter would have to glorify God. Unlike our witness, John, Peter was not going to live such a long life. And after all this, this extraordinary story from the seashore. Jesus says, follow me. And it's not too late because Peter does not say goodbye, but follows Jesus. This beautiful story recounted by John 
a story that speaks of Peter and Jesus, but also speaks to us. It speaks of a Jesus showing up when it feels like hope is lost. It tells us of a Jesus as a guide, helping, showing us what to do. It speaks to us of a Jesus of kind hands, at the fire showing grace, showing how to be graceful towards others before they have ever done anything for us. And it speaks to us of a Jesus who forgives, who forgives us in ways that we may not always understand, but in ways that he knows we need. And it speaks of a Jesus who asks us to follow him, to accept the responsibilities that come with it, and to accept that there may well be sacrifices. There may be places and times we need to go that we would not have chosen for ourselves. But it speaks of a Jesus who will be there with us and says, follow me. And so with that, our witness John finishes his story. And he ends his gospel with these words. There are many other things that Jesus did. And if they were written down one by one, then I think the world would not be big enough to hold all the books. Amen. Let's come now with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let's pray. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God lasts forever. Gracious and loving Father, in a changing and chaotic world, we come to you who are from everlasting to everlasting, the eternal God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you are holy, merciful, and a righteous God, abounding in steadfast love for your children, we come with expectation and confidence to your throne of grace, we thank you for the new and living way that you have provided for us in Jesus, our high priest, whoever lives and reigns to intercede for us. We thank you for the rich inheritance we have in Christ. He died on the cross in our place so that we might know forgiveness and cleansing and so much more. We thank you for his finished work on the cross. Thank you, thank you, Father, for not sparing your only Son, but sending him to us, so that in him we might have a new life, rescued from the bondage of sin and darkness, and brought into the light of the kingdom of the beloved Son. As this day of worship and thanksgiving draws to a close, we thank you that the voice of prayer is never silent and that your word of truth in the scripture strengthens and encourages us. We thank you for songs of worship and praise. Give us a deeper understanding of your word and draw us ever nearer to you. We pray at the beginning of a new week that you will walk with us and talk with us as we journey with you. We thank you that you will never forsake us. We can rejoice that you, who have begun the wonderful work of salvation in us, will continue that work until you come or take us home. We pray, dear Lord, we may be teachable and usable, we pray, like Paul, that we may be content in all situations and trust in your redeeming love. Despite 
peacemaking attempts, the military conflict in eastern Ukraine continues to take lives every month. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, devastated by war and violence, fleeing their, from their homes, mothers with children and the el elderly in their families, living in crowded camps and for the men forced to fight to de in the defense of their country. We thank you for those who have opened their homes to many and shown love and compassion for them. Father, we pray your hand upon these people in their great need to bring comfort, healing, enabling, and courage. We pray too for many other countries where people are starving. Father, we cry to you for those who suffer the most, the poor, the disabled, the vulnerable, and exploited. We pray especially for those who are persecuted for their faith in the Lord Jesus. Father, you know and you care for each one. Strengthen and uphold them as they fix their eyes on Jesus. At this time, we pray for all the aid agencies which are stretched to their limits. They work tirelessly to bring food and clean water. We pray too for many volunteer doctors and nurses who bring much needed relief to the suffering and traumatized. And so, Father, we pray for our church here in this place. We pray that we may be good disciples of Jesus Christ, remembering an important command from Jesus. See that you love one another as I have loved you. Many dear ones are in our hearts tonight, members of our church family, our own family, neighbors or friends, let us name in a quiet moment before our loving Father who knows their deepest needs. May each one know they have a friend and comforter in Christ and may they know his perfect peace. And we pray for the Kirk session that in all decisions, you will help us, Father, to do what is right and pleasing in your sight. Teach us day by day, Lord, in our daily walk with you to seek your will and holding on to the hope we have in you that stands the test of time, a hope that lifts us when we are weary and a hope that fills us with joy and believing, that hope which is built on nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. These prayers we bring in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so may we go out knowing that the God who showed such grace, such love, and such forgiveness to Peter will be with us this week and all those we love. Amen. <laughs>